Hello friends, my name is Tushar and today I'm going to talk about how to design an autocomplete feature for a search engine. This is my second design video. If you have not already watched Design Tiny URL, I would highly recommend watching that. So what is autocomplete feature? I'm pretty sure most of you must have already used this, but just to recap, if you go to Google or Bing search engine and if you go to the search bar and if you start typing, for example, how does then it will immediately show you a list of options and you could select this options or you could continue typing and based on that it will return you uh, the search results. So in this design we are looking uh, for, in, in, this, in this video we are looking for how to design a system which will populate this list of options. Autocomplete is very interesting because it has some interesting challenges around scalability, it has challenges around availability and latency. Also, design questions are very subjective. I have no clue how these companies implement autocomplete feature. I'm just basing this on based of my experience and talking to my friends and peers. So next, let's see how autocomplete feature would be designed. Before going to autocomplete, let's talk about some of the things which we are not going to cover in this video. No spell check. So as you know, uh, the search engines provide you spelling correction as you type and we are not going to cover that in this video. No locale information. So person searching for something in Seattle or London would get the same set of autocomplete results. No personal information. So we are not going to use any of your personal information along with public information to show on the autocomplete result. And we are only going to concentrate on the English language. So basically what we are saying is that we are developing a minimum viable product which hopefully is flexible enough such that these features can be added in the future. So next let's talk about autocomplete for search. When I ask autocomplete to people, most of the people come up with this word try. And try is a correct answer, but designing autocomplete is more than the try. Autocomplete, in my mind, involves two basic things. One is a request flow and one is a data collection flow. In the request flow, you get a prefix, you look into your distributed try, and then you return a bunch of results back to the user, which is the autocomplete for that prefix. In the data collection flow, you're getting a list of strings from a background process and you're going to, and then what you're going to do is take these strings, aggregate them and then apply them into the try so that it can be used to answer the queries. So next, let's talk about how to uh, first design our request path. Also, if you don't know what try is, I highly recommend you watching my video on try. The API for the request flow is very simple. You're given a prefix and you need to return a list of autocomplete words for this prefix. Let's talk about the try here. So let's suppose I have a bunch of words and I create a try for them. For example, bat, bath, ball, bit, bits, and bill. So in the try, what we're going to do is we're going to store their children as we do today in a regular try. And along with that, we are going to store top k terms for every prefix in every node. So for example, for b, the top uh, k, and here we'll pick k as 2 to keep it nice and simple. So the top two terms for prefix b is for example bat and bit. So here in b we are going to store two things, bat and bit. And how we are going to decide that? We're going to use our data collection flow to decide what are the top uh, k terms for every prefix based on their weight. Similarly, for prefix ba, the top two terms could be uh, again bat and let's suppose bat. So at a, along with storing its children, it's also going to store bat and uh, bat and bat. Similarly, for bi. It could be storing bit and bill. So every node, along with storing the children, are going to store what are the top uh, two or top k uh, autocomplete terms for that prefix. Why are we storing this format? Because when the request comes in and when the prefix says just b, I can quickly look it up here, bat and uh, bat and bit. I can instantly return that back instead of looking into my entire subtree to see which are the top k 
for uh, which are the top k uh, terms for the prefix b. The, there is one problem here though. The, this, this try will be very huge. If we had, theoretically you can have millions or even billions of phrases. So putting all that in one try in one node is neither durable nor scalable. So it's not good for availability, it's not good for durability. So next let's talk about how we are going to distribute this try into multiple machines. This is further breakdown of components in the request flow. Let's suppose it's 1998, Google just started, they do not have a lot of data, so they know that all the data they have can fit in one try. So we have try T1, T2 and T3 in three different nodes and all of them holding the same replica of try uh, um, within them. So why do, we have, why do we have three nodes? For availability purpose, such that if one node goes down, then other two nodes can continue to serve the request. And also for durability, if one node is lost, we still have the try information in other two nodes. So this piece of information is stored in this Zookeeper instance here. So what we are saying is that starting from prefix A all the way to the last character, here we are just going to assume lowercase English characters, but this can be easily expanded to handle uppercase and other characters. So we are saying that between this range A to dollar, dollar is our last uh, terminal character, all the, pre all the prefix or, or the try is in this T1, T2 or T3. So anyone looking for the prefix between A to dollar should look into either of the three nodes. So let's see what happens when a request comes in. So let's say client types BA on the search bar. So the request then goes to this load balancer. If you do not know what load balancer is, I highly recommend reading about it. So in this case, load balancer will delegate the request to one of the nodes N1 to N4 based off, let's say, round robin mechanism. So let's say that request lands at N1. So N1 gets BA and he needs to find what are the autocomplete terms for BA. So first N1 does is looks into this distributed cache to see that if BA, if we already have a data for BA, so let's suppose we do not have the data for BA in this distributed cache. So our, he makes a request, he gets nothing back. Then N1 is going to consult this zookeeper to see who is responsible for this prefix BA. So zookeeper at this point of time only has one range A till end of the character. So it returns him back T1, T2 and T3. Uh, so he randomly picks one of the nodes. Let's suppose it picks, it picks T2. So then it goes to T2. And in here, uh, we have the try which we discussed previously in the, vid in, the, in the video. So he gets BA and it instantly returns BAT or BAT. And then what N1 will do is he will populate this information into the memcache first just so that the future request can then be handled directly from the memcache or from the distributed cache instead of looking all the way into the try. And then uh, he, it will also return the response back to the load balancer who will return the response back to the client. And in the client you will see this bat and bat populated as a drop down option and then the client can either pick that or continue to type different character. So that's a, that's a very, very simple flow. So next, let's see what happens when, when, uh, when, when the things cannot fit in one try and we need to split uh, a try into multiple nodes. Now more and more people are using Google and they realize that they cannot hold the try data in just one nodes. So they need to split this data across multiple nodes. So this is one way they could have done it, or this is one way in which this service could be designed. So what we do is, uh, we instead of saying that uh, A to dollar, everything is in T1, T2, T3, instead we say something like this. A to uh, K, here K is exclusive and A is inclusive, goes to T1, T2, T3, and k to dollar goes to t4, t5, t6. So they introduce three new nodes which will hold replicas of each other. And t4, t5, 
t5, t6. And now we are saying is that try or all the prefixes starting from a up till k, not including k, will go to t1, t2, t3, so we'll go here. And all the prefixes starting from k till the end of the terminal character will go to t4, t5, t6. So now when the request comes into the load balancer and to any of these nodes, they're going to see that what, where this prefix would lie. So they have this information from the zookeeper and they will look at it and they will be like, okay, the, word, the, the, the starting character is, let's suppose, L. So they know that it falls under this in this bucket. So they are going to go and look that up into either T4, T5, or T6. Let's suppose uh, it gets, uh, continues to get more and more popular, so we can split this even further. So now we are saying is that, uh, let's suppose A to uh, BC is going into T1, T2, T3, and BC to K is going in T7, T8, T9. So we further broke that A to K into two subcategories, and now any request from prefix between A to BC will end up here, or will end up from B to, to BC to K, or from K to dollar. So in this way, theoretically, we can keep expanding this information as long as uh, it, it can be held in a zookeeper data. So zookeeper is very good with, uh, is, very, is highly available. It's very good with lots of reads and some writes. So as you can see here, we are doing very little writes. Only when we are ready to split a range into uh, multiple ranges, that might happen once a day or once an hour. So Zookeeper handles that really well. And then he's getting a lots of reads. So every request is uh, going here. And, uh, and then, so in this way, Zookeeper can handle this really well. So as long as this config information can fit in the Zookeeper, uh, we will be able to split this further even more. So this is, uh, this, is our, this is my introduction to how you could handle a request flow. Remember, this is just my solution and uh, many different people might have different views and I would be happy to learn what other ways uh, this can be handled. So next, let's talk about how we are going to collect the data and put that into the try such that it can be used to answer this uh, prefix based queries. Data collection is equally challenging problem and uh, just to be clear this is just one way of collecting data and uh, there are many different techniques through which we can collect the data. So in this technique, our, so first of all our API is phrase and await. So every time someone types searches something on Google they send this phrase to us with some weight attached to it. How they do that, we don't care. That's outside the scope of this problem. It could be coming from a Google search term, it could be coming from a news website, it could be coming from any number of data mining techniques they do. Ultimately, our, uh, our data collection flow is getting this stream of phrases and their weights. So for example, uh, we are getting, let's say, bat with some weight. So then we have this bunch of aggregators which will aggregate a bunch of these results and save them into the database. So a bat comes in, let's with some, with some weight, and then we say that based on some, some sort of hashing, either consistency or modular based hashing, we will send him to one of the aggregators. So let's say that ends up in this aggregator here, bat. So this aggregator will keep, continue to aggregate bat and other similar terms for some period of time which could be either two minutes, five minutes, or, or until certain data is collected. So he does that collection, and every, every certain interval of time, based, uh, he will flush that information into, into our database. The database I've used here is Cassandra, but theoretically you can use any database. Cassandra is a NoSQL database, and uh, what we do here is that we collect the data, uh, and let's look at the schema here. Our schema is phrase, time, and some of the weights for that time. So what we are saying is that, let's suppose the time right now is 2.15 a.m. on November 4th. So aggregator collects the data for, uh, aggregators collect the data for a certain amount of time. Then they flush that into the Cassandra. So we're going to say that for BAT, uh, for BAT, whatever the, uh, sum of the weights is add that to this uh, this sum of weight 
So anything from 2, uh, 2 a.m. to 3 a.m. will go into this particular way, row. So our granularity is, is by hour. After 3 a.m. we'll create a new row and every data from 3 a.m. to 4 a.m. will 4 a.m. will go into that row. After the current day passes, as an optimization, we can aggregate all this hourly data and create a daily data. So as you can see, before November 4th, for November 3rd, 2nd, and 1st, we aggregated all that hourly data and, uh, uh, and got a sum of their weights and uh, converted into a daily data. So we can do a bunch of optimizations here. First, we can, lose the, we can lose the data older than certain number of days if that's not important for our autocomplete feature. Second, if a phrase has less, less weight, if their sum of their daily weights or some of their hourly weights is less than some number, then we can get rid, of, get rid of that phrase altogether because we know that that phrase is not going to show up in our, uh, in our uh, autocomplete result. So now we have this aggregation of data. Uh, so first, why do, we, why do we store data in this timely format? Because so that we can give w more weight to the current data versus some old data. So something happening more currently or recently, you might want to have a, give him more weight so that he shows up in your autocomplete results versus some high event which happened like 30 days ago. That's why we are storing data with the time attached and we give flexibility to our algorithm to choose, pick and choose how he wants to apply the weights based on the time. So once we have collected this data for millions and tens of millions of phrases based on their time and sum of weights, we're going to have an applier and he's going to apply that into our trial. Next, let's see how. Our appliers are going to get the data from this database and then apply them into the try so that the new so the request can get that data. So in our case, we have three range A B A to B C B C to K and K to dollar. So we'll have three appliers. These appliers would run every 30 minutes or 15 minutes or some uh, pre-configured interval and then they will work on their respective range. So A1 will just work on range A to BC. So he's going to get all the phrases from this database which are between A to BC. So he'll take all those phrases and then based on some mathematical formula giving weight, more weight to the current uh, time versus old time, he will come up with a list of, he'll come up with the weights for all the phrases. Then he's going to build that try internally in this supplier where where we'll have where every node will have the top k terms for that node and then finally take the try and then dump that in t1 t2 and t3 so every new request after that time will have will see that new data so that is a very simple applier i'm sure a lot of experimentation would be done i'm i won't be shocked if there is some machine learning also involved in deciding how to create this try but all that is outside the scope of this problem. There are two other optimizations I wanted to talk about in the request path. The first is uh, if a user is searching for a, query, for a prefix from say Seattle, it would be worth putting the, it would be worth caching some of that result in a CDN in Seattle. So CDN is content delivery network and by, by having, uh, and CDN is usually close to the end user, so having a data in the CDN the request can just be served from the CDN instead of coming all the way to the data center. The second optimization I can think of is that if someone is searching for BA uh, prefix, we might as well return him the result for not just for BA, but for BAT, BAL, and other, other prefixes, other popular prefixes, so that as and when he's typing character, he's not, he's not coming back to our server every time, but instead he already has that result cached in into his local machine. So this is all I have to talk about how to design autocomplete feature for search engine. Uh, please let me know in, your, in the comment section how you like this solution and I would also be happy to hear what are your ideas. Thanks for watching this video.